Sometimes, life changes unexpectedly in the blink of an eye. A previously unknown allergic reaction, a lightning strike, a slip and a fall. Freak accidents that forever alter existences. The Robertson family once experienced an extreme version of this. They were over a year into an amazing sailing trip around the world when an unusual calamity suddenly changed their lives forever, forcing them into a life or death struggle for survival upon the high seas. The plan to sail around the world began as a whim. In the fall of 1968, the Robertson family parents, Dougal and Lynn, 16-year-old daughter Anne, 17-year-old Douglas, and 9-year-old twins Neil and Sandy were living a hand-to-mouth, hardscrabble existence running a dairy farm in Staffordshire, UK. One night, Dougal was telling the twins bedtime stories of his stint in the British Merchant Navy when Neil asked if the family could sail around the world. Dougal leapt at the idea. The farm was on the verge of bankruptcy. His kids would get to experience travel and life in other countries in a unique way, so why not? The Robertson sold Meadow Farm and purchased the Lucette, a 50-year-old 19-ton, 43-foot schooner. On January 21, 1971, the Robertsons set out aboard the Lucette, departing from Falmouth, England. Other than Dougal, none of the family had sailing experience. Immediately, the Robertsons had a trial-by-fire experience. Six days into their trip, while sailing through the Bay of Biscay off the coast of France, they were caught in a fierce storm with 40-foot waves and 60-mile-per-hour winds. Thankfully, the family survived the storm, learning to sail as they went along. They spent the next 17 months sailing the Caribbean, stopping in ports of call such as Antigua and Barbados. Eventually, Anne met a young man, fell in love, and decided to stay in the Bahamas. The rest of the family sailed on, visiting the Panama Canal. Along the way, the Robertsons took on a 22-year-old Welsh hitchhiker, Robin Williams, as a deckhand. He was going to sail with them all the way to New Zealand. Robin rapidly became an informal part of the family. June 15, 1972 began as a pleasant, typical morning on board the Lucette. The Robertsons were sailing about 200 miles west of the Galapagos Islands. They were two days into a 40-day trip to the Marquesas Islands in French Polynesia. Boom! Just before 10 a.m., something slammed into the hull of the Lucette with the force of a torpedo. The boat shuddered, lifting into the air. In rapid succession, two more hits battered the boat. There was a thunderous cracking sound as the hull split. Three orcas had rammed the boat. The unusual frenzied attack was over as quickly as it had started, the killer whales vanishing back into the depths of the ocean. But the blows had dealt the Lucette a fatal structural problem. She was sinking, and fast. Pandemonium ensued as the family scrambled to launch an inflatable emergency raft in a small dinghy. There was no time to radio for help. Lynn was still in her nightgown when they abandoned ship. Though Lynn and Douglas had close calls, thankfully everyone safely made it aboard the emergency raft. Within about a minute, the Lucette was gone. The Robertsons were left dazed and disbelieving of the sudden turn life had taken. Floating around them in the water was Flotsam from the Lucette. Drifting nearby, tethered to the raft, was their 10-foot dinghy which they had christened Ednamere. Ednamere was half filled with water and riding low in the ocean. The inflatable raft they were sitting on wasn't much better. During deployment, it had somehow accidentally been punctured. Dougal took charge and the family began rescuing whatever they could from the water, mainly Lynn's sewing basket which turned out to have needles, both knitting and thread, some razors, a ball of strong yarn, a ballpoint pen, etc. The family also had inventoried their supplies. In the emergency kit for the raft, they had vitamin-fortified bread and glucose, enough for 10 men for two days, 18 pints of water, 8 flares, a signal mirror, a baler, a first aid kit three paddles, and assorted fishing gear. In their mad dash to abandon ship, they'd grabbed a bag of a dozen onions, a tin of biscuits, ten oranges, six lemons, and a bag of candy. They also had some large snails and some sailing gear. Things were looking grim for the family. They were caught in a strong current. It was nearly impossible to row the 200 miles back to the Galapagos Islands. They were over 1,000 miles northeast of the coast of South America and over 2,000 miles west of their original destination of the Marquesas Islands. They weren't adrift near any shipping lanes, so their chances of being sighted and rescued were slim. Even with extreme rationing, their water wouldn't last long. Worse yet, no one knew that their boat had sank and that they were lost at sea. Rather than sailing toward land, Dougal and Douglas came up with the idea of sailing north 400 miles to an area of the ocean where the northern and southern trade winds collide, called the doldrums. The doldrums are known for their calm water and mild surface winds. It also frequently rained there. The Robertsons would have fresh water. After the doldrums, they would assess where to go next, but would probably try to sail toward America. This route would take them through the shipping lanes that go to Australia and New Zealand from America, increasing their chances of rescue. The next seven days were difficult. The Robertsons bailed out the Edna Mare. They reorganized their supplies to maximize space, storing them in the smaller dinghy which they firmly tethered to the raft. 
Dougal assigned a watch schedule and sleeping positions for everyone. He tried as best he could to sketch out on a scrap paper the direction they should sail in. The family battled seasickness. The dip and sway of the tiny raft was much different than sailing in a boat. Lynn often recited the Lord's Prayer and sang hymns. She devised a set of stretching exercises for everyone to do to help create a routine and maintain their muscles. Just in case, they cut part of a sail and wrote goodbye letters ahead of time while they were still lucid. Lynn and the twins wrote letters for Anne, while Robin wrote one for his mother. The letters were put into waterproof wrapping and tucked into a pocket of the raft. The castaways carefully rationed the food and, after some missteps, figured out how to catch fish to supplement their meager supplies. They drank spinal cord fluid and sucked on fish eyes to slake their thirst. They also dried strips of fish for later. Unfortunately, catching and cleaning fish attracted nine-foot sharks to circle the raft. Day by day, the leak on the raft kept growing, though they kept trying to patch it. Their mouths grew sore from taking turns blowing up the raft to replace lost air. They were wet and cold all the time, as there was always water in the bottom of the raft. Only the thwart seat stayed dry, and they would take hour-long turns sitting on it. Lynn would often give up her turn for her younger sons. Their sunburned skin became encrusted with salt and broke out in painful boils. On day seven, the Robertsons spotted a ship in the distance. They used up all three of their rocket flares trying to signal the boat. They became extremely disheartened that the ship didn't see them and sailed on. Eventually, they reached the doldrums. Dougal fashioned a spear and managed to catch a sea turtle. In addition to eating the turtle, they drank its blood. It had rained briefly once or twice since they were shipwrecked, not enough to collect a supply of drinking water, but the bottom of the Edomare had collected a few inches of brackish water mixed with bits of offal and turtle blood. The liquid wasn't safe to drink, but worried about the lack of bowel movements, Lynn, who had training as a nurse, administered enemas to her family using rubber tubes stripped from the rungs of the raft ladder. When taken rectally, the liquid was less poisonous. It wouldn't travel through the digestive system. Robin declined the treatment. Over the next several days, Lynn would periodically administer more enemas, eventually switching to turtle oil rather than water. Finally, 16 days after the shipwreck, it rained. And then it rained some more, all night in fact. After the initial joyous relief of getting fresh water, there was a new problem, too much water. The Robertsons took turns bailing out the raft in the Edomare. Finally, on the 17th day, they had to abandon the raft. Patching and bailing couldn't keep it afloat any longer. The castaways moved to the Edomare, having carefully thought out which items from the raft they could take with them into the cramped space. The Robertsons put up a sail and steered northeast, taking turns rowing when there was no wind. The rain caused mold to grow on the strips of dried fish and turtle meat they had carefully been preserving. They gorged on what they could and discarded the rest. The rain continued on and off the next few days. More than once, they thought they spotted something in the distance, and a few times even used a precious flare or torch to try and attract attention. Since the wreck of the Lucette, there had been many arguments and tense standoffs between the castaways. Dougal especially had an explosive temper. On day 23, the Robertsons got caught in a storm that lasted most of the afternoon and late into the night. There was thunder and lightning with torrential rain. Even worse, the Edomare was in severe danger of being swamped by waves. Everyone was exhausted from bailing. At one point, Robin had to rub feeling back into Dougal's dead, tired, ice-cold arms. After hours of battling the storm, Douglas thought that his dad was ready to give up. But then his mom looked at his dad and held his eyes. Then his dad said, bail for your lives and bail twice as quick as you're doing now. Reinvigorated, they did. They also sang songs to help stay awake and stay warm. Somehow, they made it until dawn when the storm began to quiet. Every day was a new lesson in misery. By now, the castaways' clothes were rotting off their bodies. It hurt to sit in a single position for very long. There was little padding on their bones. Also, their tender, boil-infested skin would break open, sting from the salt, and weep pus. Their hands and arms were crisscrossed with cuts and scratches from catching sea turtles, which had razor-sharp claws. The Robertsons' lowest point came when they lost their water reserves. They had a couple of tanks of water which were tied together and hung off the side of the boat. While trying to catch an angry sea turtle, the creature slashed the rope with its claws and the water tanks floated away before the Robertsons could rescue them. They were left trying to save rainwater in a plastic bag and small cups. On July 23, 1972, their 38th day adrift, at twilight the Robertsons spotted a Japanese fishing trawler, the Tokumaru 2. Dougal lit a flare, waved it like a madman, and tossed it high into the air when it burned his hands. He was frantically trying to light another flare when the ship turned toward the raft. They had been spotted. The Robertsons were extremely dehydrated, their mouths so dry and their tongues so swollen with thirst they could hardly talk. The fishermen didn't speak much English anyway, and the castaways know Japanese. However, the two groups were able to communicate through hand signals. 
The Robertsons convinced the fishermen to save their stinky battered dinghy when they would have abandoned the Ednamere at sea. The Tokumaru II took the castaways to Panama, where the British Embassy put them up in a hotel and gave them medical care. Slowly, they made full recoveries. Ten days after being rescued, Robin flew home to England. The Robertson family returned to their home country at a more leisurely pace, sailing home via ship, although this time a large one, the MV Port Auckland. Dougal and Lynn's marriage disintegrated, haunted by the arguments they had while shipwrecked. Lynn went back to farming. Dougal returned to sailing and wrote a book about his family's survival experience. Many years later, Douglas also wrote a book, weaving in and expanding on portions of his father's book. And now, you've got an ordeal to take on for yourself, choosing between these two videos. We know you're going to want to watch both, but you can only pick one, so make a decision quickly and pick one now.